takes on the fantastic side of art. He enjoys designing new worlds and new creatures. He holds a master's in fine art and printmaking from the University of Michigan and a bachelor's of fine art and drawing from the Cleveland Institute of Art. And um, he is, uh, I think he's almost ready to go there. So we are gonna, we're gonna switch it over to you, Mark. Oh, since you said it, Elizabeth, I'm gonna hold it up here and break it. This is the book oh, that Elizabeth was talking about. This uh, came out from Dover Publications and it's a whole book of me sort of going through and dealing with different kinds of ways of handling concepts and drawings and creating worlds and creatures. And that's something that I have a great deal of love and fun with. So what I'm going to do today is just show you a little bit about how I sometimes draw and how I go into doing it. And so we're going to make it sort of a down and dirty, quick and easy kind of thing. And if you do have questions, feel free to ask because I'm, as Elizabeth knows, she's an old student of mine. I can probably talk until the paint comes off the wall, but while I'm drawing, I can too. Is I'm working on a comic book called Thunder Hunters. And it's a story about an artist who goes into a <clears throat> undiscovered land area and meets all the indigenous tribes and the people and he makes drawings of the strange creatures and the animals he meets, and then he collects their myths and stories and tells them in sequential art. So it'll be a mix of sort of um, like a James Audubon, so you'll get all these wonderful drawings of weird creatures and strange things like that. Then you'll get a little story about where and how these creatures and myths sort of grew in the land that he is going through, which is called Vermilion Stance, excuse me. So that's what I'm working on right now. And in the past, I've worked for video games. I taught at Northern Illinois University, and I taught at the Madison Area Technical College, and also at the uh, School of Art and Design in Savannah. And, um, and I've worked at three different video companies. So I'm sort of all over the map. That gives you a little rough kind of uh, attitude of where I'm coming from. So. Let me, let me just sit down and, and hammer on a drawing because I guess I'd rather get something going that way so you can see and I can talk to you about how I approach a drawing. Now you're gonna find that all artists approach things very differently. And I always remember what an old drawing teacher of mine said, and that was Jack Youngquist. And he always said, if it's under $9.99, it's a face. If it's over $9.99, it's a vase. So in my life, you know, I do a gesture drawing, but if you're in the art center and the art school, it's called the movement or the force or everybody's got names for everything. So it's always kind of fun as an artist to just see how they take the same old stuff and, and rewrite it and rearrange it. You know, like I say, if it's under $9.99, it's a silk screen. If it's over $9.99, it's a stereograph. You know, under $9.99, it's an etching. If it's over $9.99, it's an etching. So the only one that doesn't get that is lithography. Lithography is just a litho no matter what, you know. Alrighty, so what I'm gonna do is just sit down and start designing a little creature. And what I'll do is I'll show you a little bit of my process of how I get started. And then what I'll do is I'll draw for a while, get it built up, and then I will pull out a finished drawing and show you uh, tight pencils that are a lot tighter. And then what I'll do is uh, ink some of that with a couple different tools so you can see the different ways that you can make marks and what you can do with tools. So the thing that you're gonna see, and I draw with a blue pencil. This is a Prisma color raised blue. And the main reason that I do this is that um, traditionally comic book artists used to draw in non photo blue because their artwork would be shot on a stat and the blue would just drop out. So I got so used to drawing in a blue pencil that I just keep doing it anyway. Now when I scan them, I can go in and drop the blue out um, in the computer, but it does pick up beautifully. So when I start drawing something, I think first of all of what I call gesture, and then I think about shapes, and then I think about form. So if I'm drawing a creature, if I'm drawing that, the gesture is gonna become the movement. It becomes a simple thing that I build off and, I, and I'll draw a little darker than I do normally. Kind of that way. Here's a head shape. This is gonna be sort of a neck shape. 
this will be a movement for the body and we will bring this out and you'll drop a leg and we'll drop the leg over here okay so now i'll come in and the next thing i'll start doing is i'll think of the shape of the head so i don't do detail i'm just getting a rough movement and this will be the shape of the neck this is starting to be where the collarbone might fit in we'll do the rib cage and that'll sort of fit in here we come down and we get the rest of the waist and everything so we'll put the shoulder up here so we'll come over here and we'll do this we'll give him a little hand we'll come in and so what you're kind of seeing me is is me building this really quickly with rough shapes to start to define the form and that's what i'm kind of doing now jack youngquist as i was saying my drawing teacher was also someone that just said don't waste time in other words you know when you look at what i'm drawing you see how little i'm drawing a lot of people will come in and when they start drawing they like go yeah. and i call this the godzilla method where you're just sort of crushing all the helpless natives and you you know you've got so many lines here you don't know where they are and what they're doing whereas if you look at mine that head shape starts to become a real simple line and a real simple form so now if i come in let's 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 pop an eye shape up here with the brow we'll come in and we'll cut in that we'll give him his ear back in here we'll come up and let's give him a big nostril coming up we'll come down to his upper jaw that's going to come back and down to lizards and those kind of guys it's a little bit longer comes further behind the eye and i always like to give them a little sort of funny bump sticking out there we'll come in and we will start to get the lower jaw the neck is starting to take shape there if you want to add anything to them we could add a couple little uh, lines it might become a, a fringe or something like that so you can see that very simply, I really sit down and I try to think of it in terms of shapes first. And if I don't like this, I don't have much, you know, like, like here, I don't have much to erase, do I? I can come in and just pull that right out. Now, one thing that I do a lot, when if I do erase, I like these clicker erasers and it's a white vinyl and it does this. And you know, you make noise. So I, I can always tell when I'm thinking in the studio because you hear that clicking sound a lot. Okay, so even if I come in and just lightly lighten that up a little bit more. So now what I'll start to do is once I've got some of these shapes developed and I'm happy with them, I can come in with a tighter contour line and let's start to build the start of a little bit more of a finish. So we come in and we put in this little tear duct put the lower eyelid in, coming down in here, give them a couple little wrinkles. We can come here and if we want to give them a little funny nose, or maybe we give them a little horn on the end of his nose, so that kind of comes in and does that. We've got that started. We can darken that in a little bit more. Now let's come down here, but what we can do it too is we can also play with the whole characteristic, which I like, and I'm going to give them sort of a snaggle tooth sticking out. So we'll have a couple of teeth sticking out here. So you can kind of see that that pokes up a little, gives them a little more character. Bring the, the line back for the mouth. And now we can come in and if you want to make this a little tough with hair, <clears throat> I can come in and just create that hairline by breaking it up a little bit like that. So it's not quite as smooth as the rest of this. If we come down, let's come in here. We'll capture a little bit of a dark underneath the jawline. That little dewlap that hangs down the neck. We come up down the neck, back of the head. And of course, he's got to have a little wrinkle or something in there. We come down and, you know, if we want to give him a couple little spikes growing up, try not to make everything the same because nature is always that sort of wonderful asymmetrical. So there's a feather. Since dinosaurs now have feathers, you know, we have to be conscious of that. Which is always kind of interesting to see how much, you know, like for me, I grew up with the Brontosaurus, which got taken out and removed and was replaced by the Apotosaurus, 
by the scientists. And now they're saying that the Brontosaurus does exist. So he's back in the pantheon of dinosaurs. So I guess if you wait long enough, all your dinosaurs come home. Okay. So does that, does that sort of make sense a little bit, the way that's moving along? And, you know, if you want to put an eye in, I mean, this is so interesting to me because what Youngquist and a lot of my drawing teachers just talk about, we put one little tiny dot here that creates a certain kind of emotion, doesn't it? Like he's, you know, looking into the bright sun or he might be doing something like that. If we come in and make that bigger or we make it a little bit more like a cat and do something like this, you can see that gives you a completely different kind of feel for the emotion and the face. If we want to make them a little bit matter, let's come in here and create this line and cut that edge a little bit. And now he's perhaps not as happy because his cell phone just died. Not yet. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. Greg's telling me not yet, but you know. Well, mine's plugged in. Yeah, mine's not. So. <laughs> But anyway, so we'll come down here. We'll work on something like this a little bit. We can add a few more scales. So if I follow the form of the cross contour, I'll do something where I'll come across that neck to try and create the roundness. And then I can wrap all those scales around. So we've got that happening there. And um, let's, let's start his arm here. So we'll come down. We'll make them a little bit humanoid so I can just talk about some of the shapes. The deltoid that you have up in here breaks from the collarbone into a big long, uh, uh, excuse me, a sort of teardrop, reverse teardrop shape. Your bicep, your, um, excuse me, your tricep would show up there. Our bicep drops in here and then starts to go down into a pectoralis. We can come up in here and put this in and all of a sudden we're getting a little bit of the brachioradialis that's coming around and now we'll come up here to the wrist and then if i have a light coming from up here that means that um excuse me i'm sniffing you're gonna get a little bit of a dark here this line might be heavier on that side might be that way so you can actually start to create a feeling of light and dark by how you play with the thickness and the thinness of your line and how that would interact with the form so you get a feeling of a thick line coming in so that's inserting into the form and if you come here and you build up just a little bit of mark but you follow the form around you can see that creates a real different look than just doing the straight line as i'm doing just right here which kind of creates a tone so we'll come down to the hand we'll give him one knuckle we'll give him two knuckles we'll give him three let's come up there's a knuckle 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 so we come up in here and we give the roundness to the knuckle because really your finger is the two bones that come together become a big large joint there so really it's your knuckle is going to get rounder and then as your finger moves away from that it does its tapering <laughs> So, it's moving, it's moving. So here we go. So now we've got this kind of thing. And, you know, we've got this. That's gonna come in. And now I'll do is I'll bring his thumb up, create a knuckle, go across, another knuckle. And we'll come back in and create that little hand. We can create a shadow for the knuckle in the sense in there, create a little bit of a dark in there. And if you want to give them some wrinkles here, follow the form around or follow scales so that that would sort of feel following the direction that that moves around. So all of a sudden you can see that that creates that form and we get a lot of nice kind of little feelings for that. So we bring in the other collarbone here, bring this in, bring the chest down. And that means I could bring the deltoid down here. We bring the bicep in front of it so that that line gets heavier here, it cuts in front of that form. And then I'll light that and then the tricep in a sense, we hear a little bit of, see a little bit, excuse me, see a little bit of that. 
and then we're coming down getting that. So here we come in, we can bring the rib cage in however you want to do it. You know, I'm going to bring it in so we have the center line here. This is dropping down for sort of the gluteus maximus. And you can see here, I can come in if I want to create a heavier upper part of the thigh, a little lower, and we can come in here, we'll come to our, our knuckles and then we'll build our foot out. So let's do this too. We'll come out here, bum, bum, bum. And the one thing I, I guess I will say too is, is that you guys, Elizabeth knows this, and the, the, some of the other students that are, if there are some that are watching, I do tend to make a lot of noises when I'm drawing. And it's just kind of, you know, just helps me feel that, you know, I've got the little bump, 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 you know, you know you're making the little sounds. So, you know, if this guy would sneeze, you'd have a few little dust mice come off of him. So you're always trying to come in and create a believability to your figures or I do, which is very important to me that they, you know, because each person is uniquely different. You might have a little scar under your eye. You might have a little, you know, red dot on the cheek, or you might have certain things. So you can come in and you can add all that stuff. So if I really want to make them look not that happy, <laughs> why am I dealing with not happy today? Hmm. Must be technology. <laughs> uh -huh. And I and we have to thank Greg for putting up with me and doing this on the fly. He pretty much got roped into it. Uh, you can't see it, but I do have a gun on him. <laughs> you know. And thank Greg, you guys. Is, I'm You're sorry. Wrong. Yep, it's all his fault. So when my phone dies and I disappear, and it's Greg's fault. There you go. Okay, so let's make a uh, hand that's a little curled up. So if I come in here and I create one part of the palm, the other part of the palm, we'll bring this thumb up, bend it in, do this. Here's a knuckle, here's a knuckle. There's that, that, that finger and that little claw would fit in like this. So that brings that hand in front of that. So as we come here, we can come in here and create uh, this moving up a little bit. We'll bring this one over a little bit so it becomes almost a fist, but not quite. And, you know, you can have one finger coming up, but this is a family show, so we don't want to do that. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so here we go. We're going to tighten in on this a little bit. So we create that claw. We do that kind of a thing. And, you know, we come in, and I love the lines around the wrist. And you've got the nice little tendons that come in here. So we can do that. If you want to give your guy uh, bumps, you know, like all these kind of, they're coming out with so many new skin textures for dinosaurs. It's really pretty incredible. So let's create sort of a nice bumpy, um, pointed skin with just all sorts of funky stuff coming. So that's going to be nice. Now here's the thing that I would be doing and I would yell at my students, but I'm already doing it badly. And that is, if you look at this arm here, it's this long, and if you look at that arm, so he's got a short arm here. So really this needs to be moved out a little bit. So, um, you know, we haven't drawn that much and you should never be afraid to come in and get rid of your mistakes if that's, you know, something that's important to you. So we now need to think about that elbow and that being about up to there. So you see this should come in a little bit longer, but now I can just build those shapes right back up again. And let's do something a little bit different. Now, when I was drawing the Aliens comics, this is something, everybody has a different kind of physiology. And the writer, Mark Verhagen, had a thumb that he could bend back like this. Now my thumb doesn't do that. So I just thought that was so amazing in my simple little mind that every character that I drew in the comic book, their thumbs would do this because I couldn't do it. So you can have fun, you know, watching and observing uh, life and maybe you really do enjoy some different things. So you bring those things in that you see and you know, what you want to do. So, growing up in North Dakota, we 
we had big tall grasses and you would wait and then when the seeds would get on the top like this you would go out and you'd sort of pull out the grass and there'd be this end down here would be really bright yellow and then you would sort of suck on that for a little bit and then you get sort of a little sweet grass juice and uh, life was much better. So tell us a little bit about, you mentioned like, oh, all these dinosaur skins coming out. Like, so how you, I know what a stickler you are for re your own reference. Mm -hmm. material and you know not copying but using using sources so tell us about that because i know you you will take this blue and, and maybe a little bit about the digital side of it as well what you might do with well the digital since we have greg here he's a photographer you know and he goes out and he captures something in the photo and then i as an artist just copy it well really i'm stealing his work you know so i i shoot my I shoot as much of my own reference as possible for people and, and things like that. In a lot of cases, I have models of dinosaurs. In some cases, what I've done is built some things. But sometimes you do have to, you know, use reference from the, of a photographer or someone that you're seeing. But I use the old illustrator thing is that you have to change it about 60 to 80% because this is what I have always said. It's like in class, I go, if you take this piece you're working on, and you take the photograph and you put it next to the piece and you go, Grandma, does this piece of painting or this illustration look like this photograph? And she says, yes, you've just lost your lawsuit. Okay, because if Greg finds out that I've been using this painting and strange photos, excuse me, for years, he might you know, decide, well, I think it's time to show Bonehead a little, you know, you can't do that. So it's just like anything else. You know, if you go into the museum and you copy a Rembrandt, you can't really say that that's yours. You may learn from copying Rembrandt by what he does. And, and I know in a lot of the art schools, and I've done it too, you copy some of the old masters so that you can sit down and figure out how and why they might use a certain type of line, how it's moving and different things like that. But if I make a copy of a beautiful hand drawing, I can't say that that's my drawing. But if you put in your portfolio that you say, you know, this is based on Aang's drawing, so people know that you, you know, that was where your starting point, and all that kind of stuff, that's something else. And that's a portfolio piece that you can show, but you can't sell that as your original art. Um, so it is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm really conscious of that because the photographers changed the whole look of the fine arts because if you look at a lot of the early masters and all that kind of stuff, everything is in focus. And when you turn and look at the turn of the century with uh, the photography, which was being developed, and you have focal points and you have depth of field, which is something that hadn't happened. And all of a sudden these photographers are, are producing these beautiful images with, you know, different focal points and different things like that. So you look at some of the painters like Corot and all these people that started to look at photos. It, it Vermeer, yeah, it really helped. You know, Vermeer was using the lenses. Thank you, Greg. And, and things like that. So again, it's, you know, you have so much stuff at your fingertips. I mean, and right now, I mean, I have a massive library and everybody always comes over and goes, wow, look at your library. And they say, you know, you can get all this stuff on the internet. And I say, no, you can't because I've got books and I know because I've tried to find certain things, more reference on the internet that I can't get beyond that book. But then on the other hand, I have found a lot of great stuff on the internet. So it's, you know, where are you looking at your references? You know, when you sit down and you look at National Geographic from 1928, there's a certain character to the photos, there's a certain quality, there's a different kind of look to it that there than there is right now because of, you know, the digital and what we can do. And you start looking at the old glass plates or, um, come on, what's the other thing, the 
<laughs> how do you say that? Daguerreotypes. Daguerreotypes. Thank you. See, that's why you got to have intelligent people around you so that <laughs> you sound better. And, um, you know, I mean, so it's like, what are you trying to do as an artist? What do you want to bring to the field? What do you want to bring to it? And I don't care if it's, you know, uh, a simple thing like someone like Jules Olisky or Deepen Corn, who are more non objective painters that they're just talking to you about the color red and how they react to it. Or you're talking about the beautiful light that's hitting the plants or the roses in the garden. Or you think of someone like Bonet who would go and paint and set up his easels. And, um, excuse me, he would set up like six easels and he would start painting on one. And then when the light changed, he would go down to the next one and work on that. And it was sort of known that he could sort of tell you the time of day by looking at the wall and just tell you the, by the color of the wall what time it was because of the way the sunlight and everything hit it and did that kind of stuff. So, you know, as artists, we're really given quite an incredible smorgasbord of ideas and things stuff to look at and do and get excited about and ask yourself what do you want to do with that and where do you go and you know i really do enjoy texture and surfaces so for me putting all the scales on the dinosaurs you know but then again what kind of scales snake scales are different than um turtle scales some scales are plates some scales have to be flexible some are small dense move in and do this and that you know, fish have a, a whole different kind of scale system to them, which is really exciting too, because they really stretch. And if you see a single scale, you're, we're only seeing about a quarter of it. Three quarters of it goes behind the other ones. So you've got, just doing a little bit of research, it's amazing what you find out. So does that answer your question, Liz? And a very long-winded uh, Mark Twain go all over the map answer. That, that absolutely did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can see how quickly by working with shape and getting the forms going, I can build up some of this stuff and I can keep going back in. And like I say, you, you see, I just erased out. Now this shows up right here. And again, I'm drawing darker than I normally would because I'm worried about the reproduction. You guys seen it. And I haven't timed myself. How much time do we go? Do you know? So. Okay. So. We're at seven forty. So. Uh, okay. Twenty twenty minutes. You've been about twenty twenty five. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do this. I'm going to slide in. Here's another drawing that I just worked on recently. Now. You can see, if you really do look in here, you'll see a lot of my structure lines are still visible in a lot of the characters and the figures. And some of the little things like right here where there's a little extra light bump sticking out. But you know, if I ink this now, I can you know leave that out or erase it when the ink is done. But again, this one I'm working a little slower. I'm not working as fast. You can see I love pushing the textures in the horn. And then I'm using a different type of hash and a mark stroke for the hair and how I build that. And the hair here versus the hair here versus the hair here versus this kind of curly Q hair and all that looks in there. So that's one of the things that I have a lot of fun with. And then obviously my sense of humor where you've got a sheep here who's got rope stretched and this guy's driving his car on two wheels across it. The parrot's, you know, trying to help him by balancing it. The fish has got him cold, so he hopefully doesn't snap off that way. And then, of course, you got the frog who's just eating all the dragonflies as you go by. This guy's trying to do his job, and he's just, like trying to talk to him. And then you got the poor goat who's just going, "This is my world," and the fish is looking at him, saying, "Yep, and welcome to it." So you can kind of see that from that simple beginning. You know, I can go in a lot of different ways very quickly. I can try some different things. You can add humor. You can add different kinds of things. So sometimes with me, I'm always thinking in terms of a series of drawings and a series of <clears throat> little experiments. Like this is the first goat horn, excuse me, that I did. And I've done about four more of them now. And they get more elaborate with 
different things happening. So I think it's just kind of funny to think of, here's the, uh, when I was a kid, you could go to the circus and all the higher, high wire packs, excuse me, all, all those guys were doing all this stuff. So I'm just thinking there's a poor goat and that world exists between his horns. Um, now, so just, just to sort of tell you, I work with a color erase. I got the click eraser. I used to use a white vinyl eraser. This one is called the Vanish Eraser, which is really nice because it doesn't, you see how quickly it pulls the pencil off and it doesn't chew into your paper. Your pink pearls and some of those things really do chew into your paper. Now, if I was to do this really when I go more traditionally, what I would be doing is after I do my blue pencils, I'll come in and I use a lead holder, not a mechanical pencil, because this, when you squeeze it, you see the lead's a two millimeter lead that goes in there. And then you have a lead pointer that does it. Whereas a um, commercial mechanical pencil is just a consistent size and I don't have one here, believe it or not. So what I would do in a lot of cases, if you're sending this out to someone else to ink or you're doing that, you can come in and you can lighten up your image just a little bit. And then you can become very specific and very clean with a graphite lead and come in and really make sure all your edges are nice and you know how you're going to come in and do something and then you can come in and i'll just pull in a few little tones and a couple little dots and the interesting thing is i know i did uh, a job for dc comics and i did a cover for an Aquaman and, and the editor that I was working with said, your pencils are so tight, we could just shoot from those. And I just said, eh, I'm still too much of an old school because even when I go in and ink, I will add more texture. And he just laughed and he said, yeah, that's you. So he knew my work and he knew me. But you see, so now that would be, you know, the next step would be, laying it out lightly in blue and then doing this. Now I drew very heavy as you can see in the blue pencil, just so that it, it reproduces for the camera here and we're doing that a lot more. Okay, so that covers that. Any questions? Nope. If anybody okay. wants to ask anything or put it in the chat, please feel free. Yep. What, what is the specific name of the blue pencil you're using, Mark? Um, you can get what's called a non-photo blue, but that's too, I have, I don't see non-photo blue very well. This is, and let's just do it here. This is a Prismacolor. It's called a Cull Erase, and it's 20044 blue. And it, it sharpens and it takes a really nice point. And I'm working on a nice bristle board and it so happens that this bristle board, and I don't know if I see plugging people, but it's uh, Blix Bristol. And it's, you have the choice between a smooth, -um, smooth and a vellum, and this is the vellum, which has just a little bit of tooth, but it really takes these pencils beautifully. And when you're working with ink, it takes, uh, the ink very nicely too. Sometimes a smooth bristle will actually, because it's been pressed more, will actually reject the ink a little bit on the surface. So everything boils down to your tools and your papers. And I'm not gonna say that one bristle is better because I draw on Strathmore bristol, I draw on Blick bristol, I draw on the uh, uh, fanboy comic book art bristles. I've got them all and I draw on all different kinds of papers. And sometimes it's, it's just kind of nice so that you sit down and you try different papers and see what they're going to give you. Now, I don't buy cheap paper. In other words, if you buy in a Bristol board that's costing you $5.99 for a thousand sheets, it's going to be pretty cheap, bad Bristol. And the one thing that I've found is even though I went out once and I bought the most expensive Bristol, the manufacturer that did it didn't do a great job and it wouldn't take ink. The ink would just bleed all over the place. So now I have like six pads of very expensive Bristol board that I use just for pencil drawings. 
So you have to be attuned to your tools and different things. And just because you use a blue pencil doesn't mean you're going to be any better than anyone else. This just goes back to that whole thing is my background in comic books and all that. And the other thing that I like about it is that it's much harder to get a really dark line. Whereas if you sit down and, and this is, okay, I'm using a 2H lead, which is a very hard lead. And most people draw with just a regular pencil and that's usually a 2B. And I don't know if this has happened with any of you. Here's a 2B lead. You kind of draw, and you see how dark that gets really quick? Whereas if I sit down with my blue, I really got to work that to get to that dark that quick. So this just makes it easier for me to make decisions and then I can erase out a little bit more. And the other thing is, is that you can see that your 2B pencil smears very quickly and easily, whereas this doesn't. So that sometimes you have all sorts of wonderful stuff that you can play with. Now, one trick that I learned, and I'm just showing you, this is called an eraser bag. And what it is, is a little sort of, I just call it a sock, but it's fabric and inside there are eraser crumbs. And if you just do this over your drawing, you can see the little crumbs appear. And now if I come in, I can just lightly rub this on there and you see how that lightens up my drawing? And that will get rid of some of this. And what that does to me is it also pulls some of the grease out of the lead and it won't repel your ink when you're inking. And this goes back to drafting in high school. And then that means you need to get a brush and then brush it off. Because if you do it with your hand, you're invariably going to smear something. But there's a couple tricks. So you've got, you know, if you're drawing too much and you're drawing too heavy, get yourself a little eraser bag. And you can see how I can lighten up that whole drawing. And now I can come back in. And if I want to clean up and get that line exactly the way I want it in blue, I can do that. Do you ever use the needed eraser, Mark? I need that for more when I'm working on some toned papers or things that I'm smearing, like what I did down here, and you pull out. Um, I'm not that big a fan of needed erasers anymore, but I know people that use them and they're very happy with them. And, you know, it's just like whether or not you want mustard on your hamburger or not, you know. But for me, I guess I've just gotten so used to the vinyl and this kind of thing. And they make a couple. Oh, where is my little puppy? Uh, you would know if it would disappear. They make all sorts of erasers that you can buy. The vinyl erasers, click erasers. Itoya makes one that's got this little tiny point so you can go in and just erase this little tiny bit out. So, I mean, whatever you like to do, but I've always just found that the kneaded eraser is, is fun when I sit down and I put graphite on the paper and I come back in and I can pull it out or use it to create textures and surfaces. So that's when I'll use more of a kneaded eraser. But, you know, Again, it's to me, it's sort of six of one, half dozen of the other. You can do it with a knitted eraser, fine. You can do it with a vinyl eraser, fine. It does the same thing. Does that make sense, Liz? Oh, yeah. Yep. You know me, non committal, not Mark. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, we know you're but, committed. Yeah, about the drawing so far or anything like that. But you can see the difference when you draw it in with pencil. You got a real different kind of feel. Sometimes it tends to block it in and makes it more, uh, how do I, I don't want to say solid, but you know, if I was to give this now to a someone to ink, they'd be much happier inking this stuff than they would be inking some of the things in here. Okay, so um, you want me to go on to doing some inking, Liz? 
Yeah, yeah, that would be great if you want to show everybody some meeting and maybe maybe talk a little bit about your uh, process and like the experiences of being a comic artist. I mean, as a student of yours, I remember you coming into class and you would teach us and help us with all our stuff and then you would talk about how the night before you were inking this or doing that. So it, you were always working and, and um, juggling all those different projects. Uh, sounds good. <laughs> <All right>. Now, <laughs> what I'm trying to do here is when I was a kid growing up, when we used a technical pen that looked like this, it had a metal tip and, you know, this would be, you know, there's a cartridge in here. Oops, this is one that comes out like this. And that has the ink in it. Nowadays, the technical pen that most people are, we're calling them technical pens. There are things like, you know, the pen. And what that is, is the same thing, but you've got like a little felt, hard felt tip. So technical pens were designed to create consistent, even lines. Now I grew up with, you know, line weight. That was the guy Youngquist taught me, was taught me about the quality of a line, just like I was talking about the characteristic of where a line goes into the form, it might get darker, where it comes out, it might get lighter. Now you can't do that can with a technical pen, but it's it's hard. You sometimes have to come back in and retrace. So if I'm coming in here, you see this is designed to make a consistent even line like that. So for me to, to make this thicker, I have to come over and retrace that line. And of course, what do I do? I buy, get, grab the one pen that's dry. <clears throat> So he goes to his cabinet, see? And that's the other thing that I've learned over the years that I've missed anything. And I always kid one friend, just she goes, I went to the store and I bought a colored pencil. And I go, A, just one, A colored pencil? You know, because when I go, I'll buy three or four, half a dozen, something like that, because just like right now, I was gonna go ahead and ink this, and all of a sudden my pen is dry, and that means I can't go to the art supply store because they're all closed. So once again, you see, if I want to thicken that all in, I would, excuse me, be doing something like that. So as we start inking this little guy, you can see I can't get a lot of line variation. I can if I draw the thicker line and speed it up. So what I really learned is the traditional brush and pen and ink. Now, with a nib. So what you've got here is, this is sort of a handmade inking. Uh, what they call this is the holder, and that's the nib. And this one fits really beautifully to my hand. Now, this one is one I've had since undergraduate school. And this was nice because you could carry it in your pocket. And you just do this, you see, and then you could be inking away, there's the nib, there's the holder, and then when you get done, you could stick this in there so you wouldn't tattoo yourself. Now, what's always happened to me is that nice little objects like this that they make, they quit making. So I have two of them, but that's it. I've never been able to find another one since. And you're gonna find that different pen nibs come in different hardnesses and different weights. And, you know, here I have, some of my pen nibs, you can see, these are ones that are from China, or not, to me, Japan. I've got different flat noses. I've got, you know, the crow quill, which is what I use. The 104 is one that's done for a lot of little details, which, you know, is another one. So you've got different kinds of, see, that was an Esterbrook. There's your 104 and your 102 crow quills, which is what I'm using. So, ink is another thing that you're going to find is that every artist you talk to will tell you different inks to use and what's the best and i keep finding myself trying different inks and the thing that happens to me is when i look at ink i ask myself 
I also have to look at the paper I'm using and different things because like this ink may work beautifully on one type of crystal board, not as well on another one. But recently, this is the one I've been using is the Black Star Dr. Martens. And I find that a really nice dark, rich matte, matte black, you know. And there's a new one out called Blink that's very black. Um, I've got, oh, I got more inks that you know what to do with. Okay, so we dip the curl quilt into the bottle of ink. And then what you're gonna see now is we would come down and you see I get a very fine line. And then as I push down, I can get a thicker line. So you see the curl quilt will now give you the characteristic of being able to change the thickness and the width of that line. So if I want a really light little line, I can do that. And if I want to come in, I can push down just ever so lightly. And all of a sudden, you see I've got a line that tapers. It can do different kinds of things. Uh, uh, boy, that's great. And the other thing that I really about quill, and this is just me, and it's why I can always tell when somebody is thinking with a quill, is you see sometimes you get those little kind of wigglies, you know, your line isn't quite as clear, you know, like that. And you, okay, and I'm going to show you just the difference here when I use brush. Now I got to re dip and apply my ink. And now the one thing I do do, and I'm sorry, but I'm gonna do this. When I ink, I'm a paper spinner. So I'll try and keep this centered so Greg can tell me. But a lot of times I'll come in and when I know I'm gonna do a dark in here, and then I'm doing that. Up or down? Towards you. Okay. No. 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 Oh. Yes. Forgive me. I'm sorry. You are correct. <laughs> Excuse me. I have to fire fire my accomplice. All right. Okay. This will work. <laughs> and that's the other thing that you know, if you're in your studio by yourself, if you were laughing and doing what I was doing right now. Uh, you're probably in trouble, you know, I mean, you're talking to people, you get voices in your heads, but, um, yeah, it's not really anybody here. Yeah. Greg is my imaginary puka friend, you know, from the movie Harvey. Okay. So now you, you see, see the difference here is that what's happening is you're getting a lot more line variation and you get the idea of license that pulling in on that edge. Whereas here, I had to spend all that time redrawing that. Whereas here, I could make it in one line, couldn't I? So part of that is your speed. Part of it is different things like that and how you develop. Now, the other tool that we all learned on was a brush. And when you look at a brush, a brush, uses a, this is a round. It comes to a point and you're using a sable brush, you're using a Windsor Newton or a Raphael. They're, they're absolutely stunningly beautiful brushes. And I used to use those for years. Series Oops. seven. Yeah, series seven. And the thing is, is that these brushes cost about 30 bucks a pot. Plus, I found this, which is called the Pentel Color Brush. It's actually a plastic tip, but it's a brush tip. And I'll show you one that's not been inked, but um, you can kind of see it's just, and this is all bristle. Now, the nice thing about these is they have that same flexibility and touch and spring that a brush does, but I would use one of these for six months before the tip would wear. So all of a sudden I'm going from $30 an issue to $9 for six issues. So sometimes you do have to be aware of that, but the brush is going to give you the most. So you see like this, if I really want to come in here and I really want to push that into a thick line. Okay. All right. You can really see that I can really push that even more. And you're not hearing that scraping sound. 
Now, as a joke, I always used to say, but it is true. The main reason I quit, I didn't like using Crowell pen when I was younger, was the screeching sound of the pen against the paper drove me nuts. I just hated that sound. And then as I got older, I developed tinnitus of the ear, and I don't hear quite as well as I used to. So I don't hear that screeching sound anymore. So now I use Mark, more of the quill. Yes. Just to interject, because you um, somebody had asked about the uh, the nibs also being direction sensitive, and is that sometimes why the brush is easier? I mean, I noticed you turning the paper and, and everything. Yeah. So. Well, let me let me show you something with that. Just because um, people always say that about a pro quill. And because people will go, they'll go back and forth and all of a sudden it goes spring and you get that little splatter of ink is what they're talking about. Yeah, here is, I'm sorry. This is it now, it went to low power mode. You get about 20 minutes. Okay. If I take this tip, you see, I'm drawing in all different ways and I'm not getting any spring whatsoever, am I? No, you're not, no. So you have to understand, okay, because you see I'm holding it there, but now let's do this once. Here's the thing that really, if you hold, if I hold this way down at the end here, it's still gonna make a line, you know? So you don't have to really push that hard. So in a lot of cases, you know, if I come in, I'm running out of ink here, but you know, I can come in and I can move However, you know, in different angles and come back over and back and in. Once in a while, like right here, you see a cot. But, you know, if, if you're pretty, you know, just. I just got so used to feeling of the pen and the way it hits the paper that, you know, that's just something that I'm really, really, really uh, attuned to. So, yes, I think. Sometimes just let the pen do the work for you. Let it glide across that paper and you'll be surprised how you won't do those zinger things, you know? And a lot of times too, I think part of it is, is how you hold the nib. If you hold it at an angle, so it's gonna dig, see there, now I'm getting it, right? I got one of those splits, but that's hard for me to do. Cause I always hold it this way and you can see if I, I go all different ways. Well, you know, you make everything look easy. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's part of it because really it's all magic. This is not happening. Greg is just wishing it and it is happening, you know. <laughs> really, I'm covered in ink and there's just giant divots and holes in this piece of paper and, uh, but, that's why I say, and a lot of times when I say to people, just just hold your pen out here once, and just get the get the feeling for you know how you can move around with this, and that will tell you how much pressure you have to use to get a line. But you see, I'm not getting any springs in that way, am I? No, so, and and the ink doesn't really does it um, soak. Soak the paper. There's another question I have. Doesn't it? Well, this this one was. Let's, let's see. Yeah. See, that's still that's dry already. You know, most of the stuff okay. is already dry. So I'm really conscious of a bunch of different things. One, where I'm inking. So if I'm inking here, I'm not all of a sudden going to go up here and start inking and then smear across all this. Usually, when I was working in the comic book field, I would start in panel one up in the upper corner, excuse me, right there, Whoop, like in the upper corner, and then I would just work across and down to the end of the page. Now, because I spin more, you know, you can see I'm working around on different things, but there's so much, you know, that's what I'm saying, like with this, there's so much fun. I To do this with, a, with the quill, that's really going to be hard, and even if I do do it, what I do do is I will do it in two strokes instead of one, or even sometimes four, just because to push it that wide, it really does, it wears that point terribly. But you know, 
now when I sit down and I just ink on a lot of this stuff, and I can look at this and I can say, okay, this is the crow quill. And I know how light that is there. But I can turn around and I can grab the brush. And because I'm attuned, hopefully, a little bit to just the way the brush moves and how much pressure I have to put on it, the same as I do as the quill, you know, you can see I can do the same thing with the brush like the quill. And if you want to do long straight lines or thin even lines with a brush, it's just sitting down and practicing. You just got to sit down and you got to say, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. So you just have to, you have to practice, practice, practice and doing things with tapering lines so that you get a flow, you know, how do you want to use the brush to create your surfaces and movements? And do you ever use like a piece of paper to help protect the smears, like the buffer paper? Or... Once in a while, not any much, not very much anymore. I mean, the other thing too, and part of it is, and I'm not, I don't want to sound evil, but you know, some people, you know, if you eat a bag of chips and then you sit down and you start drawing, you're going to put a lot of oil on the surface of the paper, which will repel the ink. So if you're worried about that, you know, they make those those white animator gloves, which are really quite beautiful, and you're going to stop all your smearing. So a lot of it is depending on you, a little bit of your physiology, different things like that. You can sit down and um, try some different things, you know. I, as you notice that I'm drawing, you can see that I'm a, I'm a terrible spinner of the paper, you know. So I, I keep spinning things around and work that way. But anything that you do, you know, how do I do that? Look at that. I got a big blooch. Um, it's off camera, you don't see it. I went in the shutter. Oh no! <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Do you? Did you see it? I did not see it. See, like I got that. And then it's just all over my table here. So some people's kids. This is the professional way to get rid of it right here. Yeah. <laughs> it's fit. Fix Lick the temper. paper. And well, I can clean that later. Yes. My uh my spritzer's not here. And usually I have a cleaner who would just go. But anyway. So that kind of gives you a, a quick little feeling for all that stuff but let me do this quickly <clears throat> which i was thinking i was doing something doing it differently oh okay here's one that i can oh, i gotta find some ink right. uh, different ways of using ink now you asked elizabeth and this is some um, a friend of mine down here got really excited about goose quilt drawings. So this little sketch here, and I'm gonna go grab the goose quilt. We made goose quills and um, you know, carve the ends and the tips, shave these down, bake the ends in sand, and then you can see we cut them and then we dipped them. So I was drawing some things because this is what Leonardo used. Wow. You know, so they didn't have all the steel tips that we have today and everything. So they used goose quills. Now, so here is, oops, excuse me. Here's a little drawing that will show you uh, a lot of different kinds of cross hatching here. You know, you can see in, in the wings, there's long straight lines, cross hatch coming in this way, a lot more built up in the layering here, but I'm working on a gray paper using the cross hatch to create a softness. And then I came back in with white pencil just to pull it out. But you can see with the bird here, I kept that contour line in the branch really thick and really dark. 
and up in here I kept that line very thin and very fine so you created the difference in the space and what was happening there. Sort of like the one that you have on the uh, Lamont Art Guild uh, poster there because that's a really that's a really great little drawing I think but that's just me. Yeah, you mean the, the logo image we used for your yeah. uh, for your promo. That was like the winner. That just really, I thought, was just such a good piece. Well, your pieces are all good, but... Yeah. And, you know, something like this is a little bit more complex. But you can see, once again, this is all quill. So that, you know, um, I'm pushing a whole bunch of different kinds of surfaces and different textures. So that's the kind of nice thing where, you know, these lines are very light and very thin. These lines are a lot heavier and darker. And you can see the contour line is, uh, you know, one side here is much darker than the other side because I pushed down. <laughs> I mean, for me, I feel so blessed that I had Mark as a teacher because he was always coming into class showing us this showing us that and you i'm sure you hopefully you guys just i'm sure you do get a feel for his um passion passion for doing this but he always was so encouraging of, of how anybody could just use, use their passions and just practice 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 that's the important thing you know i mean as i say i mean i go to the art museum and i can look at people like Stephen corn and all the abstract expressionists and I can learn from them from the way they move value around them and move color around and I can go look at Albert Dorr, Rembrandt. I can look at everybody and anything and learn some stuff, which is what's really nice. So this one is actually all brush. So I'm just sort of trying to pull out a one that's a little bit different. So you can kind of see that, you know, with the heavier strokes and here, and the different kind of characteristics that they have. I work on a, I color a lot of my comic books right here at this, uh, and I use a Dell because the PC was what was the university standard in video games. But then on the other hand, I know how to use a Mac too because the Mac was the standard for illustration, advertising, and all that kind of stuff. And if you go right up here, you can see I have a lot of dinosaur toys, my favorite Dino, and I, I'm obviously a huge Stitch fan, <coughs> excuse me, which I think is one of the best designed characters ever as far as what the emotions that you can get out of them do. And you can just see I have more dinosaur stuff <coughs> up there. And that's music. Obviously I have the TV when I'm drawing more reference books, <laughs> my watercolors. Um, and these are all, <coughs> excuse me, photo references that I've shot. And they're all labeled and I put them in binders. We're back. So do you guys want to just do a little more Q&A kind of thing? You want me to show you some more drawings? I mean, I love tone paper. There's a fish drawing I did. Um, I just got, and I should have Greg do this, go over there and just do that Thunder Hunter and see all those. Oh, things. sure. What, do you see that whole section of portfolios? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, two portfolios. You can see it says Thunder Hunters. And okay. this just shows you the amount of work that I've been going through and doing for this comic. These are all the original pages. So that's a tone paper. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm back. Well, I don't know why it's going. It's just so big. Can you come back? Yeah, hang on. The other phone. So here's another character design. So this can kind of show you elaborate I do sometimes get oh. I'm good. there we go from you
And, and someone had asked, you have some white areas in your drawing. Is that the, the actual paper then? Or you're using, oh, you're using colored pencil? Oh. We might, might have lost your sound, Mark. Yeah, it looks like it's muted. All right. How's that? Now we hear you. So now here I am back, human, half happy, smiling. Um, so do they have any other questions, Elizabeth? Because when they were asking about the other paper, when you go to the art store, you can get a lot of what they call tone paper, or paper that is of color from so many colors you want. And I work a lot with uh, the neutral grays, which is, uh, one that Strathmore makes and the tan that I use, the tan paper is uh, Stonehenge Craft, which is 100% cotton paper, which is really beautiful paper drawn. And then the whites then would be put in with a colored pencil or a little bit of white out ink or something like that. Yeah. Are you hearing me, Liz? Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. sorry about that. There's so many choices with the papers. I know that you use so many of them. <laughs> well, I mean, if I always go over and open up my flat files, if I go into my watercolor flat file, I'm working with, there's a brand called Fluid, and they make a really nice watercolor paper, and they make the 100% rag one, which is really nice. I work with Arsh. I work with Strathmore. I work with a lot of different kinds of papers. I mean, that's the one thing that I'm a real, I just love buying different kinds of paper and trying them and see how they re they react and how they work with me and what I'm trying to do. So, you know, pencil and, and, and those kinds of things work on almost every surface. Ink, you're gonna probably have some problems with bleeding, but uh, Borden and Riley make some beautiful papers for pen and ink and pencil. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can't say that there's only one paper that I use and anybody that goes to the art store with me knows that I become like a little kid in the candy store running up and down the aisles looking at paper and uh, feeling it and thinking about buying it so that I can test it out. And a lot of times on my Facebook site, you'll see just got a new pad of paper. Here's the first drawing I did. Because <laughs> as an artist, we're just we've got so many things that are out there that you can kind of experiment and play with and depending on you and how you draw and what you draw with you know you're going to find that there's some papers that'll work really well and some that don't anything else anybody have anything else they can so want yeah. to add anybody wants to unmute and have some questions in we're right about 8 30 i just want to i want to thank everyone that came on here I, and um we had some we did have like the uh, niu people on here Teresa's coming to get some beer nuggets and uh, <laughs> we had uh, uh some young people on here i know some um people going into school so there's i mean what kind of advice would you give to somebody trying to get into like the graphic illustration field with well, all your experience uh. Well, the thing about it, and that's why I was talking, Greg and I were talking about that at dinner, is it keeps changing so rapidly in what people are expecting and what they want. You know, you talk to someone at a company, I remember I was talking to someone at a company when I was teaching at MHC, and they said, I don't want to see any portfolios. I want you to submit all your work via the computer. So we went in to talk to them and about some of our students, and I, I brought in two portfolios because I said, nah, I'm still gonna do old school on them. And I, you know, he looked through the, the portfolios and he hired those guys and the people that were online, he didn't hire them. So it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's, you know, each art director, each person is so different and they have different attitudes and they say things. 
And sometimes some of you wonder what language they're speaking and what language you're speaking, but you have to always develop a portfolio because it's going to be your drawings and your skills and your abilities. And the thing is, is that if I'm going to give any advice, don't ever, ever show somebody your portfolio and say, oh yeah, that's not a very good drawing. I should have, I should have done, I should have spent more time on it. Because if that's the case, it shouldn't be in the portfolio. You know, you should be just showing the best that you possibly can. Let them make comments. And you just never know because sometimes a drawing you may really hate, that guy may really like. Um, I've had so many experiences that have been negative and I've had so many experiences that are positive and it really boils down to the person, it boils down to the job. So if I'm gonna go try and get a job at McDonald's, uh, they probably don't want to see dragons being, you know, massacred by knights on horses. But then at the same time, if I go to TSR, Wizards of the Coast, or someone like that that does all the fantasy stuff, uh, they probably don't want to see a Coke cup and a McDonald's hamburger. So you have to think about where your marketplace is, where do you want to go, and do some research. It's easier now than it's ever been. If you really want to work at Disney, go to the Disney website they have opportunities that you can get internships and you know it's all online now you don't have to sit there and write a letter and wait for a month to respond you can go online and can say we're, we're hiring for interns for this summer this is what we're looking for blah 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 and you apply and i've had a couple students that have done that and they have gone to go on and work at disney and other places in animation because you know they did that the internet is sort of a, I consider it a, a boon and I consider it a curse, but you know, use it. You got to use the tools that are around you as much as possible. A, learn how to draw, because even if you simplify down, like, you know, you see me, I'm much more complex and, but I can draw a very simple line drawing too, a la animation. So part of that is, you know, you need to have a breadth and a capability to what you're capable of drawing and working. You're gonna sometimes, in, in the field I'm in with comics and all that, sometimes you're drawing cars, sometimes you're drawing planes. You gotta draw cities. You know, not everybody is drawing Spider-Man swinging through the, um, the city on a web with this great action scene. Sometimes you have to draw them sitting down having a cup of coffee with Mary Jane or talking to Aunt May or you know just really simple things and make them believable and create an energy so that your viewers want to keep reading and looking at your work <laughs> so next who else has some questions here i, I feel i don't want to um, take up other people's questions hmm. Well, anything you want to throw out, you know, in here. Now, if they want to, they can go to grazingdinosaurpress.com, and that's our web page, and that's Anita's and mine, and you can see some of her paintings. And in her uh, gallery, it's interesting because you have two things. You have her illustration work, and then also the stuff she does for the gallery. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see what you might get challenged doing as an illustrator versus when you're doing things yourself. And mine has some of the video game work, it has a bunch of different other things in there too. So you can check it out that way. And then if you wanna see the newer stuff I'm working on, you can just go to Mark J. Nelson on Facebook and follow me there, or you can follow me on Grazing Dinosaur Press on Facebook. And if you wanna see a longer presentation of some of the inking things, and how I design creatures and my whole thought process, then go to YouTube and type in Grazing Dinosaur Press. And I think there's about seven videos there. I tried to just um, put that all back in the chat again. So it'll be, and, and usually Heather will send the chat. So you'll get mm -hmm. that in email when Heather sends the recording out. Um, okay. So, but yeah, I mean, if you guys could see the, a lot of marks. He has a lot of figures, and he has several different categories under his gallery on his website. And 
if they ask you to be their friend, will you be their friend, Mark? <laughs> Only if they mention your name, Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Mark um, is very active on Facebook. And uh, yeah. it's so fascinating. He'll put up something he's working on. And uh, I'm just always inspired by him. And, I, and I'll put up, sometimes I do step drawings where I do just what we did here tonight from beginning to end and working on that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, and there's a lot of, and I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of really, really good artists on Facebook. I have met some people whose artwork I've loved for years and we're now friends on Facebook. So when I get on Facebook, I really, my only concern on Facebook is showing art, seeing art, talking about art, and you know maybe an occasional bean dip recipe but that's about it i i stay away from everything else i just i just want to see art and be involved in that art community so that's what i do on facebook and if, if it says that you can't you know uh get in i i don't know what facebook does as logarithms because sometimes people will say well i tried and i couldn't get in and then all of a sudden four people pop up who i don't know who they are and they're in there. So either do that or you can also just follow, I think. And that's another thing that people do. And how do you um, decide when you're gonna scan something in? You have all these drawings and I'm sure, I know you love the drawings, the drawing and the inking side of this, but, but you do all your colors on, on the computer. I do, yeah, there's, you know, I scan them and then sometimes I'll color them in the computer and do different things. I don't know, sometimes it's just sort of like, I'll get really excited about a pencil drawing and I will um, scan that and put it up. Like I just have a whole bunch of those new blue pencil drawings that I put up, but I really didn't want to ink them. I just like the quality of the pencil and the character of a pencil line versus an ink line. So I just left them that way. And um, so I'm lucky because with me and doing the freelance work, a lot of stuff that I can work on on my own or for myself, I can post on Facebook and, and just have so much fun with. That's great. That's great. Hey, hey Elizabeth, you get my cheeks all flushed and red and rosy <laughs> like Santa Claus. <laughs> well, you were working hard. <laughs> I was I was drawing quick. Yeah, there we go. Uh... Well, I mean, the thing that I'll be honest about is my father just passed recently, but he was 96. And you want to know something? He drew right up to the day he took his last breath. In fact, he was drawing and sat down to take a break. And when he got up, he just coughed twice, his wife said. And he sat back down and he was gone. So, you know, age isn't something either. You know I mean? My dad is, was a brilliant draftsman. He did some incredible drawings. And, you know, his, it was his passion. That's what he wanted to do. And that's the biggest thing. You know, it's so hard to sit down and face that blank piece of white paper or that blank canvas or that blank litho stone or that blank piece of zinc with asphalt on and start something, you know? But you, as the artist, are the only person that knows sometimes what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are. And what do you want to say with your art? And that's the whole roller coaster ride that's so much fun. And we were talking at dinner, and you know, just like when you see the goat horns that I was just talking about, it's just that idea, you know, there's this whole world between two two horns of a goat, you know. And that's just kind of fun. So ideas can pop into your head different, excuse me, you know, just from walking around and talking to people and seeing people and uh you know your own experiences brian casel says that he enjoyed your process and, and thank you for sharing sharing with us we had another comment of how interesting it was i, I think it's just fascinating you know watching you and, and hearing like all your different experiences with, with all the world you've been in so do you have any um favorite art experience? I mean, as far as the comics you worked with, I mean, you were a professor for over 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
I've had so many wonderful experiences and I've had a lot of bad experiences too. So, I mean, that's all part of the world and it's growing up and it's just being, you know, whatever you are, you have to take what comes and you hopefully deal with it so that you can keep doing it. You know what I mean? I've had some pretty rough times where it's been hard to come out here and draw, but you know, my artwork is one of the only things that no one can take away from me. You know, I mean, they can take my house, they can take my TV, they can take my toys, but they can't take my ability to draw. So if I just say anything, surround yourself with people that challenge you, make you think, and you yourself think and challenge yourself and ask yourself, what can I do to get better? Where can I go? And when I look at somebody that's doing really good, good art, <clears throat> I don't necessarily always say, that's it, I'm quitting. What I say is, what is that artist doing that I like? And what can I learn from him? And then how can I grow and keep getting better and better? And it's interesting because some of my fans that I have met say the same thing that you're sort of saying, well, who do you like, you know? I can't believe people like my artwork. And we're all kind of different in how we react to um, compliments and how we react to each other. And I go through everything. I go from the primitive art, and I don't even want to call it primitive, really. I love Egyptian art. I love Mesoamerican art. I love the Renaissance. I love the Mannerist. I love abstract expressionism. I love Francis Bacon. I like a lot of the surrealists. I enjoy the, the new realists. I enjoy oh, everything. So, I mean, and I, I just remember I went with someone to the new wing in Chicago, there, the modern wing, and they were walking through and they were just looking at each piece so incredible. And I was already like three rooms down. And I came back and they said, do you see any of the art? And I said, well, there's Brant Guzzi and there's this, 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 and this, and this, and this is not really a great piece. And they went, you really do know and look at stuff. So, you know, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's, we have a world that's so incredible and so rich and so beautiful that you need to, to enjoy it and get out there and experience it. So, do I sound positive enough? Yes, you do. <laughs> Okay, well, somebody asked if that was a uh, <laughs> somebody me, asked if that was a dead man figure above your stitch figure in your so, cabinet yeah, there. Yes. Do you have a dead And I love that series, the Dead Man series that Neil Adams did. And that figure is based on I can't remember which one of the DC universe things, but Dead Man came back to skeleton instead of just being sort of a um, ghost deal. Uh, uh, apparition. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can, we can, you know, get all involved in all that kind of stuff because, you know, I worked a lot. For, I worked for D DC, I worked for Marvel, I worked for Dark Horse, I worked for Kids Comics, First Comics. I worked on everything from uh, high-end horror to funny animal stories to you know, war stories to science fiction stories. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't trade any of it for anything because every time I eat somebody new or work with some different people, it forced me to learn and grow. And, and that's what it's all about. Well, yeah, I mean, you left Northern and went into the to Ravenstop, like. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I went into the industry. Then? I mean, you, you went right into computer work. Well, the thing is, is that, and I didn't, um, I was hired with no computer experience. I literally, my first day of work, I had to go in and ask my direct, my art director, how do you get email on the computer? Because I didn't know. And the way they taught me Photoshop is they say, well, we're going to give you a crash course in two days, and then you're just going to have to really pick it up and go. So I learned that under fire is what I call it. And the same thing with the 3D program. I had to learn 3DS Max. They literally dropped off the book and put it on my machine and said, you've got a week to study this. And at the end of the week, you have to be producing, producing 3D textures we can put in the game. So I didn't get a lot of, I didn't get a lot of tutorials and teaching and things that a lot of people now do get. 
So I had I was learning everything very fast and very quickly. And the computer has changed my attitude about a lot of stuff because I can work I work in marker drawings. I did that for years, but I'm actually faster with markers on the computer because I can cut some masks and make changes really quickly. And the same thing with concept drawings. I can make changes so fast in the computer that would take me so much longer to do on paper traditionally. But on the other hand, if I just have to do a quick line drawing and design creatures, I'm so much faster on paper. So I'm always juggling what I'm good at, where I can do it, how I can push this, and then what do I need to keep learning? That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we're right about 845, so we're right about when it's, we usually step up. Um, a lot of, we had, there's a few comments that came in that it was excellent and they did us everybody um, some, you know, incredible work, incredible talent. So uh, does anybody else have any final comments or anything you want to pop out there? Um, well, did, did Amy you... said, bravo, do I get extra credit? <laughs> nah, she doesn't need it. She's already far beyond what I can okay. <laughs> Amy's uh, an IU alum. Yeah. And You're an IU alum. I remember she was always in the classroom. Yeah. You guys all worked hard, I, you know. I have no complaints. No, I mean, <laughs> well, I we're uh, fortunate to, to know you, and it's great that we can all be in touch here. So, yeah, it's I'm good. So excited so, to have had you here. Okay, no. Um, so, if you ever want to do it again, let me know. All right. We want to see some more masters. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can set it up, maybe I'd send you like a little video, show you working on the computer or something, I don't know. You know, that's the fun thing about being an artist, you know, I mean, you're seeing pretty much my pen and ink drawing, but you haven't seen as my old paintings, my watercolors and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's the great thing about being an artist. We have so many wonderful tools and things you can be expressive with. All right, my dear, we can end up talking yeah. until the cows and come home. So, you want to say hasta la vista good night take care don't take any rubber nickels yes yeah, we will uh say um <laughs> good night to everybody thank you all for coming on the call and mark thank you so much for doing this presentation it was just great great to see you working like that and uh truly a gift so nice oh, it was wonderful and thank you and the only thing that I can say to you and Amy and Teresa and all the other NIU guys that are watching or any other artist, get back and get drawn. Because if it doesn't, if you if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. Make that good art. You can do Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. All right.